Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm not quite sure how well you can hear me, uh, but I hope you can. Thank you very, very much for tuning in to the webinar that we've prepared for you today. Our topic is Path to Profitability and Investor's Perspective. Um, we are doing this, my name is Wanji, and I will be your host for this webinar. We are doing it in conjunction with Solar Plaza. So I represent Gogla, and we're doing this in conjunction with Solar Plaza. Um, and I think we are good to start. Before we start, I just want to apologize for the slight delay. Um, we were trying to keep our house in order. So I think we're good to go. I don't think we should waste any more time. Um, so the purpose of having this webinar is twofold. One, to speak about path to profitability, get to hear um, a select view from investors that we've spoken, uh, who are going to be in this panel. And then the second is to use this conversation as a precursor to Unlocking Solar Capital, which is a conference we've been preparing for for a couple of weeks, months now that is going to be happening between 16th to 17th of October in Dakar. So this conference is being um, planned by Solar Plaza in conjunction with Gogla. We're going to be having conversations on two simultaneous tracks. So one is an on-grid track and an off-grid track. We intend to have conversations like this with regards to path to profitability, that, tap, that touch on members and investors and trying to raise funding and the funding space, the funding landscape in our space. So we're hoping that um, many of you, if not all of you, will be able to join us for this conference. So brief background on Solar Plaza. Solar Plaza is a global knowledge and networking platform. They organize, they organize events, mostly in the solar space. They've, they were started in 2004. They're in over 30 countries and have organized over 125 events. So like I mentioned, we are doing this webinar in conjunction with Solar Plaza and the conference as well. So for those of you that don't know, Gogler is the association for the off-grid solar energy. Um, we represent about 150 members in the world um, and our members have sold cumulatively about 42 million products since 2010. We have um, impacted about 108 million people um, with the products that we sell and about 58.4 million metric tons of carbon dioxide has been avoided. So the purpose of this conversation and where we will start with is to speak about profitability and why that's important to us as different stakeholders in the industry. So for us, I think when any business is starting, profitability is the first thing that everybody is trying to chase. So it's the golden goal because it impacts growth and operations. So we realize that when a company is profitable, then they're able to grow more, they're able to diversify their operations. In the off-grid solar space, um, I think business models have changed over the years and they've become more complex and it becomes more and more important for companies to be able to dig into the unit economics and intricacies that come around with profitability. So here's the agenda of our session today. We will have we've had an we'll have an introduction, we'll have a panel discussion, we'll have a QA, and then we will close up the webinar. Few housekeeping issues. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat box. If you have questions, please feel free to raise your hands. You can also put your question in the tab at the bottom um, of your GoToWebinar control panel and the presentation slides will be available after.
So I will start off with the introductions. As I said, my name is Wan Jinganga. Thank you very much for um, logging on to and attending this webinar. I work with Gogla and my role there is program manager access to finance. So within access, when we say access to finance within Gogla, what we mean is we are working to increase the flow of investment into the off-grid space. Um, prior to this role, I've spent about seven years working with industry manufacturing members within different territories in Africa, Latin America, and the Pacific. I will allow my our panelists to give a brief introduction on themselves. Leslie? Hey there, everybody. <laughs> hey. Um, pleasure to speak with you all. Uh, my name is Leslie Labrudo, and I'm our head of global energy at Acumen. Uh, I'm based in London, but our company has offices around the world in East and West Africa, India, the US, Latin America, and headquartered in New York. And I lead our $20 million Pioneer Energy Investment Initiative, which is targeted at seed and Series A equity investments into off-grid energy companies. And in my role, I split my time between thinking about strategy, um, looking at pipeline and our portfolio construction to see if we're supporting the right seed stage investments to uh, help the sector grow to where it needs to grow, and just looking at thought leadership in general, spanning solar home systems, mini grids, and productive use companies, as well as clean cooking. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, Geoffrey, would you like to go next? Sure, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Manley. I lead the energy access and efficiency team at CDC. We are focused on providing debt uh, solutions across the decentralized energy spectrum from residential to commercial and industrial and also um, looking to support solutions around energy efficiency and resource efficiency. Um, more generally, CDC, um, quick background, is the UK Development Finance Institution. We invest across Africa and South Asia. We do so directly with both debt and equity, as well as through funds and other intermediaries. And we've been quite active in the off-grid space um, through all three of those channels, um, particularly around solar home systems, where we have exposure either directly or indirectly to most of the most of the large players in Africa and are increasingly building our presence in commercial, industrial, and mini grids and other areas of the broader off-grid spectrum. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, last on our panel is Edda. Please introduce yourself, Edda. Uh, well, nice to be here, everybody. Um, and thanks a lot to Gogla for organizing the session. I think it's incredibly important for the sector, both at the stage that we're at as well as our aspirations. Um, so I'm a principal at Persistent and Persistent is a venture builder in the sector. We've been basically with the sector since I would say the beginning, making investments, um, early stage investments in some of what has now become you know, the large and household names in the sector. Uh, we're invested across the continent. We primarily focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. We're, invest we're invested across the continent, 17 markets, over a dozen investments. Um, many of them have been in SHS, but we've also expanded um, our portfolio to include some enablers of the sector, CNI, um, and uh, as well are looking at productive use investments. Um, in terms of how we work at Persistent, we go very early and we go very deep. Um, so we, we, we sort of are usually the first, call it institution, um, outside of maybe friends and family and maybe some seed investing that a company may receive. Um, and so we work pretty closely with companies when they're very young and try to position them for scale and success and then also for um, follow-on investments from more, call it, larger institutions than ourselves. Um, so this topic around, you know, how, how do you get a company on a path to profitability, what does it take, is something that we think about day in, day out. And just given the level of um, contact that we have with companies working them ba with basically on like a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's finance and accounting, and, you know, other deep operational support, we really see what works and what doesn't work and what's, what's, 
what's been successful and you know where, where some of the challenges are. So happy to be here and happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie, Jeffrey, and Ed. Um, so to start off, I will throw a few questions around and the purpose of this conversation is to hear all three of your perspectives to be able to give us an understanding when, when we put ourselves in your shoes, how you look at these varying issues. So to start us off, I'm curious to know, and so this is also a question that we think about a lot and we hear from our members a lot, but as an investor, what, what do you think profitability means? How do you, how do you quantify it? How, what, what are the things you look for when you say that a company is profitable? Is it scale? Is it, is it you know, increased revenues? When you're thinking of profitability, what are the things that are most important to you? Maybe I'll start with you, Edda, because you know you just spoke last, and maybe you'll start giving us your perspective. I think when we look at profitability for a company, we really think about it in terms of sustainability um, on a very basic level, because the companies that we're going into, they're sort of just getting their legs underneath them, and we when we, when we look at is this company is set up to is it set up to do two things one survive to reach um, its next phase of investment uh, can it reach scale given the way it's currently um, organized in terms of business model as well as cost structure so for us it's really a sustainability question can you um, cover are you are you it's very basic we, we tend to look at companies both both in terms of you know kind of large large long-term scale from an accrual perspective, but we have a really strong focus on cash um, as, uh, as we work with these businesses. Are you bringing in enough cash to cover your expenses? And that's both in terms of your OPEX as well as your um, debt service, because we do know that this, this business or many of these businesses are really long-term supposed to be funded by debt whether it's inventory financing or other work, working capital financing. So on a very basic level, we just look at it from a sustainability perspective in real terms, right? Um, and the there's a heavy focus on cash and we can probably get into that in a, um, in a more detailed way. But I think that's just a level set, the way we think about it, that's, that's, that's the lens. Thanks, Edda. Jeff, what about you? How do you look at this um, from CDC? in you know at cdc how are you guys looking at profitability yeah so you know sort of looking at it through a debt lens and i definitely echo um some of the comments that ada made in terms of sustainability is obviously critical and then i think particularly when you're looking at um, pago business models the focus on cash and understanding the differences between um, cash and accounting is is really critical um and i think you know, embedded in the title of this webinar is Path to Profitability. And I think that's an important concept because, um, you know, we're dealing with early stage companies still. I think as a whole, the sector is not yet profitable. And so there are different measures and sort of increments along the way that you can look at. Um, so, for example, in many cases, we may be looking at a lending opportunity where the company will actually, even before we get to the point of the debt starting to amortize and being repaid, the company will need to raise additional equity to fund the business plan. Um, so that's one situation. Then I think um, you know, a further perspective is when the company doesn't need to raise new equity. And so then you're just looking at the ability of the company to refinance the debt because there is a permanent working capital need, whether for inventory or for receivables. Um, and then I think you can sort of see that same path mirrored in the way the accounting works. So for example, a lot of people will focus on EBITDA uh, as an indicator of profitability. And I think you know that, that is an important step along the way. Um, but in the pay-as-you-go business model, there's a big difference between EBITDA and being EBITDA positive and actually being cash flow positive. So coming back to the point about sustainability, you can actually be EBITDA positive, but still not be completely sustainable. Um, but that is nonetheless, I think, as we follow the sector and as it you know, hopefully continues to mature and strengthen, um, we'll see more and more companies becoming EBITDA positive, and then that will continue down to the point where they are actually cash flow positive. 
They won't need to necessarily raise large amounts of new equity unless it's to seize on, on a growth opportunity or something like that, and the business becomes sustainable. But, you know, I think ultimately what we're looking for are businesses that can actually um, spin off cash, return cash to, to their investors, and, um, you know, we're still quite a ways from that. Got it. Thank you. Leslie, I'm curious to know your thoughts. Yeah, I'll keep my remarks short because I know we're trying to get through quite a lot of, of questions, but I think uh, Jeff summarized her quite well. I'll just say from an early stage investor perspective, it's very difficult to become, it's very difficult to be profitable when you're a seed or series A company. Um, and again, being cash flow positive, we know from after 12 years of investing in the sector, that comes much later. Um, but the key is, is having a pathway to, and that really all starts with the unit economics for us. Um, we need to see, ideally, that there's profitable unit economics or, or a clear pathway to get there. Um, if you have negative unit economics, you're implying that, you know, as the company scales, the company's just going to continue losing more money. Um, so really spending the time to work out your unit economics to make sure that you can serve customers in a sustainable, viable way without incurring too many losses, um, really keeping your you know, customer acquisition costs in control and, and really wrapping your head around how can we serve customers profitably so that they are not only well served but the company's financials are healthy is where Acumen um, really drills down in our due diligence when we're looking at a solar home system investment. Got it. Um, well, I think that while I think there's some similarities, I think there's also differences in each of the answers, and I think it's driven by the segment that each of you is serving. So um, thank you. The other question I was, we have slated for this conversation is with regards to scalability, and if that, in your opinion, is synonymous with um, profitability. I know Ed. Uh, and Jeff and even you to some extent Leslie has spoken about sustainability so when we say scalability um, is it similar same to sustainability is it differentiated um, I want to know your thoughts where scalability starts and stops and how we differentiate it from profitability versus sustainability Jeff I'll start with you Thanks. So I think um, I sort of look at it in two ways. I think, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, scale that's absolutely necessary. Any company is going to have overheads that are more or less fixed and you're going to, you know, even assuming that you have strong positive unit economics, you're going to need to reach a certain number of units to cover those overheads and then move beyond and start generating profit. Um, so clearly there's a certain level of scale that's required, but I think as Leslie said, you know, you do need those positive economics, otherwise scaling can, um, can actually be negative to the bottom line overall. And I think one of the, you know, potential challenges around the solar home systems model is that as companies try to achieve greater scale, the costs may not be constant. And that could be seen either in trying to achieve scale by entering new markets. And I think, you know, we've seen in a lot of instances that the costs, at least the initial cost, can be very high to set up the distribution networks and, and all of the infrastructure in a new market. And that market may behave very differently from uh, the other markets where the company is operating. And so adjustments are necessary and, and that can increase costs. Um, and then uh, also even within markets, as you try to gain more scale and going deeper into the market, you may also see costs increase because, you know, you initially are naturally going to go after the sort of easiest customers. Those are probably going to be the easiest to reach from a distribution cost perspective. They'll be the most, uh, they'll be the strongest repayers. And so as you scale within a market as well, there may be factors of increased cost related to credit or distribution costs that, that have to be factored in. Got it. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Edda, your thoughts? Yeah, I think the point Jeff made around um, scaling within a market, yeah, there, there's definitely the complexities of trying to do, run a multinational company that hasn't yet reached profitability. But one of the very common um, issues that we sort, sort of see this 
question, see folks struggle with, with, with regards to this question between you know the balance between scaling and and, and, and doing it profitably is really around um, a, ability to pay and affordability, right? Because as you try to go broader in your customer segment or reach more customers, increasingly you will find that um, the market itself may not be able to support, or at least the customers may not be able to support the price of the product that you're, that you're trying to sell. And that's where we see oftentimes a big issue, right? And that shows up in your credit costs, as he mentioned. Um, so if you're looking to, and we've seen this a lot in call it like the, the, the Pico segment of the market, right? Where you're trying to reach as many people as possible because after all, this is access to energy. Um, there are some customers who just won't be able to afford this, right? And so you may be able to make that initial sale with a low down payment or whatever have you, but then over time, you know, you're not collecting those, um, those, those, those sort of promised revenues or those cash receipts in order to cover your own costs as you're trying to go deeper within the market. So I think this question around, you know, what, how, with what products can you scale and with which customers can you actually scale and do so profitably um, is one that a lot of players in the market are, are, are sort of staring down. Thanks. Um, what would you advise companies to to look out for so that th at what point should they know that this is the right time to scale or versus this is you're trying to scale too early or you're doing it prematurely? Are there indicators or things that you've seen companies do that they should continue to do or things that they should not continue to do? Because I understand what you're saying, but I'm curious to know if the, the indicators that you've seen as an investor, um, as they look to scale, that maybe they should put the brakes on it or they should you know, continue and accelerate down that path? Uh, if that was for me, um, I think going back to the unit economics, right? I think one of the things that is really hard to do as you're growing is you know, to run unit economics on, on, your, on the segments and on your expansion plan, right? Um, to Jeff's point, if you're going to a different part of the country that is harder to reach, a lot of companies, when you look at their pricing models, right, they're still running their pricing model off of the, the very first, um, the very first regions that they that they went to, right. So being very diligent around your expansion planning and re and running unit economics on those segments is really important because oftentimes what happens, you don't you see some companies don't do that. And then what you end up with is, is the surprise that is negative, right? So I think it isn't, some of it is not magic. Some of it is really just diligence um, and, and doing so on, on a pretty regular basis so that if you're selling Pico product in, you know, Northwestern Burkina Faso, you've run that number versus Pico product in Ouagadougou, right? And I think with, with, with that sort of level of analysis, some of it becomes more obvious. Now, it's not going to be perfect because you're not going to have the immediate information around customer repayment, or, but you can run sensitivities on that to see um, if, you know, what, what the risk is uh, with regards to expanding at this price point with, in this region with these customers. Now, that takes a certain level also of just um, uh, information and data collection and, you know, kind of really being on top of it from a back-end perspective that, you know, a lot of companies struggle with, but, you know, from our perspective as an investor, this is one of the reasons we, um, we, we, we founded and incubated in-house a, 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 an IT services provider, right? So that you can have the actual tools to be able to do this, this type of analysis. Um, but that's, that's one thing I've seen just pretty common um, that is an easy is a very easy way to get into negative economics territory um, with regards to expansion. Thanks, Edda. Leslie, do you think about this the same way, or do you think about it in a differentiated way? Yeah, I'd like to bring in a different sort of angle to this conversation, which is one that people often don't talk about, um, and that's and that's with respect to exits. And people might say, "What do? Why are we talking about exits on a on a call about profitability?" Um, but, you know, Acumen, as I mentioned, we've been investing in the sector for a long time, about 12 years, 
And as an early stage investor, we really wanted to look into what the market was looking like for exits, um, both for companies, how are they ultimately going to, to exit? Maybe they'll be acquired or sold or could potentially IPO. Uh, but also for investors, how do early stage investors actually recycle their capital to show that this really can be a liquid market and that it's not all just capital going in, but there actually can be capital coming out. And we're actually um, going to be launching a report at the uh, at the Unlocking Solar Capital Conference in Dakar. But, you know, we started by looking at factors that are limiting exits. And the first was that most off-grid companies are not yet profitable, and thus they become a bit unattractive to later stage investors that could facilitate exits for early stage investors. And so when we're thinking about scale and profitability, um, you know, there's often this attitude of grow at all costs you know, I need to attract investors and what investors want to see is greater footprint. And I just need to be in as many markets as possible and showing revenue growth. Um, and that is a dangerous slope because if you do that and you have this big company with lots of customers, um, but you haven't yet re reeled in your unit economics, um, you could appear on the top line to be strong on revenue, but you're actually a highly loss-making company. And at the end of the day, that creates a bit of an unstable company for company uh, for customers. And you know, if a company folds as a result of it, um, who ultimately loses but the customers? So, um, you know, we dive deeper into this into our report, but the importance of really understanding your unit economics and focusing on profitability as early as you can in your business actually makes you much more attractive to later stage investors because while early stage investors may not focus on profitability as much, saying, you know, we know it's going to take some time to get there, the later stage investors and the sort of commercial private equity um, folks who are going to be putting 50, 60 million dollar checks in are going to be looking at profitability and they're going to be looking at it really acutely. Um, so, you know, if we look at some of the, the guys who've scaled and really been able to attract those, um, those later stage investors that have those big checks, consistently time and time again, those investors said, we looked at profitability. Um, and, that, and it's tough, right? I mean, these are hindering geographies. These are um, higher than expected operating costs. They're in some of the most rural and least densely populated regions of the world. So cost to serve these customers will be high, um, but just going at it, you know, at all costs, is, is not the savviest approach. Really taking your time, even if it means slower growth, is something we're advocating for, um, mostly so that customers um, aren't left uh, with a company that can't actually serve them and goes into to default bankruptcy or insolvency. So um, excited to share more about this in the report, but I think it's also an important angle as we talk about profitability. I absolutely understand and agree with you. Um, I think the more exits we see, the and the more capital is being re-ingested into the space, which I think is what we are advocating for. And as even as we speak about exits, I think then it's um, a good place to transition to the next question, which is about uh, the duration of time it takes for companies to scale. While, um, Leslie, you said you've been in the market for 12 years, which I think should capture the scope of the and like, you know, for how long this market has been ongoing. A lot of the companies are newer and sometimes as Gogla, we get um, our members, some members feel like we're taking a really long time to get to profitability as an industry because uh, very few companies in the space have attained profitability. Whereas others, uh, which is also a valid point, feel that it's, we are, at the right pace to get into profitability. So I'll start with you, Leslie, because um, you've spoken about the paper that you're doing, but I wanted to know, do you think we're taking the right time to get to profitability? Do you think we're, you know, we're decelerated, we're accelerated? Um, you, we've seen, is it correct for us to compare this space with other industries, or do you think we should think about the off-grid space on its own because it has, <clears throat> complexities that are different and that are unique to the space that we work in. So I'll start with you. Yeah, so, you know, I think we all know about sort of the term patient capital. And when I know when Acumen started investing, kind of the, the magic numbers were seven to 10 years. Um, because again, lo these, this is, these are companies that are serving um, difficult to reach customers. And uh, with that, business model that you need to execute on, obviously it's gonna take a lot longer to reach scale. And um, I'll use our investment in, in Delight as an example. Um, you know, Delight I would, I would say is a scaled company. I think we could all agree to that. 
and we actually just exited our Series A shares um, in the company. And to me, it took um, to me that that's that's okay. Um, and and Acumen, it, it took us 12 years to actually execute on that exit. And um, and as long as we're all willing to be patient, I think, uh, I mean, I, from my personal perspective, I don't have a problem with how long it took. I don't think you can just say um, the sector should have, you know, scaled in three years. This is a, a really tough thing that companies are trying to do and execute on. Um, so for me, you know, we ha there's only a handful of, of real market leaders, but, you know, the ones that have shown that it, it can work and, and, be, and they can be profitable and scale, um, it, you know, I'm... I think I'm comfortable with the way it's growing. In fact, sometimes I see companies growing maybe too quickly, and those are the ones that um, year on year, you know, they've consistently these really impressive growth numbers, but their losses are growing at the same rate. And um, and that in that respect, I'd actually rather see a company grow more slowly, take the 12 years that you need to, um, you know, rely on the right type of capital. If you need a grant to do some crazy pilot work, use a grant, don't use debt and equity, um, and then take your time to to scale a business that's sustainable. So, um, you know, I think we have, we have good investors around the table who have that patience who understand that it's not going to be three years, get in and get out. Um, and as long as we continue to capitalize these companies um, and capitalize the right companies that have a business models that are serving customers that are working and aren't incurring uh, outrageous losses, I think the, the timeline's actually been pretty spot on. Um, so, you know, as long 20 years, I think it'd be a little bit tougher. Um, four years, I'd say we're being impatient. If it's 12 years, um, and that's kind of the where the the trends that land us, I'm okay with that. I will say, um, when we talk about scale and, and exits, um, from our research, the sector, as we all know, raised $1.4 billion in capital. And from our research, it, it, we could see that from about 12 exits, only $50 million has been returned. So, you know, I would like to see the rate of exits pick up over the next few years so we can say and, and confirm that that 10 to 12 year number is right. Um, and if it becomes a little faster and more efficient, we can, you know, start seeing returns or, or exits in about seven years. I think we're on the right track. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, Jeff, your thoughts, are they similar, different? Uh, yeah. Yeah, just I think very quickly, um, you know, in my relatively short personal experience in the solar home system space, I sort of um, started looking at it seriously in about 2016 and um, everybody was just talking growth, growth, growth. It was, you know, very much land grab mode trying to throw up big numbers, I think, to underpin uh, valuations, but also because there was a huge impact drive and, you know, just really wanting to use solar home systems companies as a way to address the energy access problem. Um, and then I guess maybe sort of a year, 18 months ago, I think there was a real shift in the dialogue that we started having with companies. There was a much more explicit focus on profitability companies making decisions around uh, where to grow, how fast to grow, cutting it back, really focusing on costs both in terms of overheads and trying to be as efficient as possible there, and also at the unit level, so really trying to strip out as much from, for example, um, system production costs. And, you know, I think that has been a really positive and healthy trend for the industry. And, you know, again, echo what Leslie said, we're not necessarily going to be impressed by huge growth numbers. We're really looking at the whole picture and very happy to um, work with some companies that are deliberately growing slower than they potentially could, but with that focus on profitability and, and getting the mix right. Thank you, Jeff. Edda? I think you're on mute, Edda. Okay, there we go. Um, you may need to mute and unmute me because I don't know anything I'm capable of. Um, yeah, no, no, I think to echo the point around exits, I mean, we're an early stage investor. We go very early. So we're that, you know, sometimes we're a seed, sometimes we're an A investor, um, sometimes we're in the founding of the company. I think the point around exits and positioning yourself as a company to have options later on from an investor perspective is really tied in. And I'm really excited to, to read that report from you all, Leslie, um, because that's, that's one of the things I think just maybe had gotten a bit lost um, when there was such a heavy focus on just grow, grow, grow. Because ultimately, 
the buyers of these types of assets, if you look at private equity, it needs like there needs to be cash, right? And so ideally, if you're in the business, let's say you're a pure play distribution company, or even if you're a product manufacturer, at some point you should have cash. You should be generating cash. And so if you're not already on the on the on the path to thinking about that from founding or from wherever you are today, you you basically you start crossing out potential partners in the future, right? Um, and so I, I do think the, the right time is now. And, and a further point is that this isn't a sector, we've raised you know, over a billion dollars, but this isn't a sector with kind of infinite capital at its disposal. And so if that is the reality where you know, capital isn't flowing, especially to early stage businesses as easily as it is to some of the larger players, then you have no choice. You have no choice in terms of whether you're asking, is it the right time to be thinking about 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 um, about profitability as I scale? You just you just don't because the capital isn't there, and you're going to have to generate internally to position yourself for additional capital and then even an exit for your investors. So. Thank you. And so, as we con as we think about this, still uh, similarly related. Uh, over the years, we've seen different business models emerge. So uh, many years ago, many manufacturers, especially the early stage entrants, were mostly focused on manufacturing and um, having other folks figure out other parts of the distribution, the value chain. And we've seen that evolve. And now we have more companies that are vertically integrated and one and taking more pieces of the value chain. My question to you three is, do you feel like there are, in your experience, are there some business models that, at, that help companies attain profitability faster? Is it easier to get profitability on some business models vis-a-vis -vis others? And I know this is, um, it's sort of, I don't want to say it's obvious, but there are some business models that are more cost, uh, that bear much bigger burden with regards to costs. But if I was standing in the shoes of uh, a, a company that wants to come and start Paygo Solar, for example, or just solar, for example, um, what would your advice be? Are there business models that will get me to profitability faster than others uh, based on your experience? I don't know where to start. Jeff, can we start with you? Um, sure. So I think you know definitely business model is is plays a huge role in in profitability, and um, I think there are you know a few different ways of looking at that. But obviously, one is just around the cash cycle um, from one extreme, you know, being a cash sale, to another extreme being you know sort of very long pago contracts and and everything in between. And you know the longer that pago contract is, the more you have to fund costs that are recognized primarily up front and then revenues that are only received um, over you know a, can be a fairly long period of time um, so that's just kind of a mechanical driver of the underlying cash flows um, that you have to take into account and obviously there's an interplay there around increasing the market size through longer pago contracts which allow you to lower the costs um, you know the the sort of the deposits and the monthly payments um, and allows you to increase your addressable market um, but I think you really need to make sure that you're factoring in the real cost of that into uh, into those pago contracts and then I think also you know it's it's been pretty interesting to see the evolution of business models and moving from a place where the early movers were all fully vertically integrated to seeing some segmentation along the value chain and and i certainly think that um, seeing some of the more distribution focused um, second gen gen type companies in, is an interesting business model and i think you know that potentially provides an opportunity to avoid some of the overheads that you would need to do the r d and um, an actual production um, it also means that you're not realizing the margins um, on, on that segment of the value chain um, but at least in principle I think you know we've seen um, that you know there's perhaps an opportunity to reach profitability um, faster with those business 
principles. Um, but you know, again, there there are trade-offs around how much of the of the value chain you're you're capturing. So um, I think those are some of the things to look at in terms of the business model. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Leslie, your thoughts? Yeah, I would say, you know, Jeff picked up on an important theme, which is about, um, you know, customer impact. And it might seem obvious, but I'll just restate it for this group that, you know, a cash sale on a unit that's maybe $180 is, is obviously not the, the lowest income customer. So when we think about, um, but, but at the same time, when you do a cash sale, it's quite easy for you to recoup the cost and then, you know, check in the box on the, on the profit side. Um, but when it comes to really serving harder to reach customers, you know, we just broke the billion dollar uh, number on those without uh, energy access um, and those that require electrification. And the remaining challenge, the 845 million individuals who now need power are going to be harder to reach. Um, and they're going to be, you know, the, the lower hanging fruit may have, uh, may have been taken away. And now we have to think about how are we going to ensure that the, the rest of the remaining, um, those that need electrification can actually, you know, achieve it and, and receive it in a way that's going to be um, possible financially. So this is where the tension between impact and financial performance comes into play because, as Jeff said, these customers may need longer tenors and they may not be able to afford the same upfront deposit. So that scrutiny that we're going to need to place around profitability um, is, is, is going to need to remain, but we may need to think about doing things differently. Um, I know there's a, a great example of B-Box and Togo, um, you know, they are receiving a $4 subsidy from the government to help them be profitable on a unit basis so that they can actually reach harder to reach, you know, poorer customers. Um, when it comes to business models that attain profitability faster, you know, I wouldn't advise a company to try to get in the market maybe with a new solar home system, the actual hardware. Um, there's, there's plenty of companies that have done that, done it well, and are at scale. Um, and obviously, there's a high capex of trying to set up new kind of hardware costs. Um, I think nowadays, you know, distribution seems to be the name of the game, and that is, uh, in my mind, I favor, and I, I think Acumen in general tends to look at and appreciate more distribution companies that actually have a bit, maybe maybe slower growth from a revenue perspective, but really understand their customers and, and go deep and, and have that ability to serve a customer um, profitably uh, on their on their books and or or nearing profitability. So I would say um, on the distribution side of things, if you have the the choice of you know, going big and expanding footprint, uh, but maybe doing so in a way that uh, could be a bit reckless versus going deep in one market, um, slower growth, but being profitable. Um, I know us as investors are, are okay with that and would advocate that, that others try to, to strive for um, just a, a better customer relationship and one that not only has the impact that we want to see on a depth perspective, but also the financial returns that we're all striving for. Thanks, Leslie. So before I come to you, Edda, Leslie, I wanted to ask you a question that's uh, come into our chat box. And one of one, one an attendee has asked if there are business models that you would prioritize as an investor. So I want to pose this to you um, before we get to Edda. And so the question is around, as an investor, would you prioritize, for, for example, productive use technology companies uh, versus regular solar home system companies? Would you would you, you know, would, are you more inclined to invest in a CNI company, for example? Does this, uh, cha the, is, does this drive your invest, investor appetite? Yeah, so, you know, Acumen, fortunately, is in a position where we can look at all sorts of different business models. And at the core of what we're looking at is companies that can really serve the poor and serve low-income customers. Um, so that's why when it comes to what Acumen might look at versus not look at, um, C&I would be something that we probably uh, wouldn't look at unless there was a compelling downstream reason as to how it was serving the poor. Um, but in general, you know, we're trying to find business models that are really working for those living on less than $3.10 a day. And during our due diligence, we actually corroborate you know, our thesis around this by using lean data during due diligence, which is a tool that was built um, within, within Acumen, is now spun out to an entity called 60 Decibels. And it's a low cost, low tech way for us to reach out to customers to understand um, the, their experience with the product or service and really under, also understand the poverty focus. 
um, of a business. So many of the companies that we invest in recently have been solar home distribution companies in West Africa, um, in, com in countries like Sierra Leone, where the poverty rate um, nationally is about 89%. Um, we're also looking at mini grid companies, um, mostly because mini grids actually have a, a strong ability to reach the poor um, because they're in such rural locations, although there's uh, much, much different financing needs from a mini-grid company than a, than a solar system company. And when it comes to productive use, we actually started something called the Efficiency for Access Investor Network because we noticed a lot of investors kept saying we're really interested in productive use. Um, we just don't know a lot about the sector and we want to learn. And what we're finding is that productive use companies um, still tend to be quite expensive, as you might expect. An off-grid refrigerator, an off-grid solar pump um, can run up to $1,000 or more, which is really out of reach for a low-income customer. Customer. So Acumen's trying to see if there's an interventions or ways that we can help increase the affordability of productive use assets to really ensure that they can get into the hands of the poor. Um, so if you're on this call and you are a company and it sounds like uh, you know, you're kind of checking the boxes for what we're looking for, um, please feel free to send me a note um, because we, we're always looking for um, kind of the next delight in our portfolio. Thanks, Leslie. Edda, um... I want to hear your thoughts as well. Sure. So in terms of business, a lot has already been said, and you know, at a risk of repeating some of it, I think for us, we've invested in a lot of the second generation SHS businesses, and the sector still remains very much SHS focused. Um, and so we've seen that, you know, our thesis from the beginning was that product will probably become commoditized on some level. And so if you can unbundle, you should. And so we've seen that march in terms of just the, the new players that have come up that, that have come up in the industry since you know the, the, the large vertically integrated ones. And we see that it actually works from a from a cost from a from a cost perspective and from a profitability perspective. There are companies in our portfolio that at this point are hitting you know, what we would consider a sustainable level in some of their geographies in like four years, five years, maybe. They may not be big, right? So going back to the question of, you know, growing profitably and growing profitably slowly, um, they may not be huge and, you know, have reached half a million people, but the portfolios are pretty sizable at this point, at least enough to attract um, in, in, in track interest from investors, but then also to demonstrate that they are reaching um, in a steady pace, a, a broad range of customers. Um, so we know that unbundling works. We've seen it in our portfolio actually work. So if you're in a segment and SHS, you know, to Leslie's point, coming with a new box, a new SHS box probably at this point may not be the most, you know, the best use of your, use of your time and capital. So if you have an opportunity where you're in a market where you can, um, just focus on pure play distribution, understanding your customer, going deep, building systems. You should probably, you know, look at doing that. Um, and then the other thing that we, we think about is also just your cost structure period, right? So if you take a step back and say to yourself, you know, how am I exactly spending money in this business? Uh, what does my overhead look like? Where am I? Um, where is my team based? I mean, getting really into the granularity of how your business is built is something that I think, you know, that I think companies that are being increasingly successful are looking at, right? So if my company is structured where I've got an HQ, and even if I'm going into multiple markets, my HQ is pretty solid, providing a ton of back office um, support, and then my, you know, my guys in whether the regions or the countries are focusing primarily on scale and really understanding that customer and really focusing on distribution, we've seen that model actually work. Um, so for us, unbundle if you can, focus on being lean, um, and if you're moving or if you're a company who's not an SHS company, for example, we're seeing a, a few more productive use companies, whether you're distributing solar water pumps or you're distributing a broad range of agri-processing um, products, you know, there is, there is a, you have a choice whether you're going to go and build your own system or whether you're going to um, buy something off the shelf. Now, depending on what's available within that segment or in that product segment, uh, you may not have much of a choice and you may have to do some you know, hardware production yourself, but you know, to the extent that you can unbundle, we've, we've, seen, we've seen it work. And if you know, your, your segment 
established this in a place where that isn't an option, then you should be thinking about how it evolves. Because a lot of the very large players who were vertically integrated, they've had to start also thinking about how they're going to compete in an environment where their competitors are, you know, completely unbundled. So, but yeah, but I think I think in some segments we're going to see some evolution, and in in the SHS segment that's much much more mature. Um, folks do actually have a choice. Thank you. So I realize we are short on time. I want to, I know that we've spoken about aspects of the fifth question about the unit economics that serve as building blocks. So I want to do um, a quick round and I want to join the two questions. So the biggest question is what lessons you've learned in your term investing in companies in this space? Um, lessons that you can share with the respondents and if you can highlight some of the unit economics that um, companies should be more focused on. Uh, I think we can start with those two questions for now and if we have a bit of time we can take some other questions that we have on the poll. So quickly we'll start with you Leslie. Uh, lessons learned. Yeah, we've uh, learned a lot of lessons, I would say, um, from our time investing. Um, <clears throat> a lot is about the right type of capital at the right time. Um, again, we've seen that early on in the sector, there was an over-reliance on equity capital because debt just wasn't there. And as a result, companies um, that are now, you know, six, seven, ten years old are really highly valued because they needed to push up those valuations to accommodate those equity investors. And, um, and thankfully, the market is now, I think, at parity with debt and equity availability. So this problem is not as prolific now, but, you know, we're seeing some remnants of um, the aftershocks, I would say, of these overvalued companies that are, um, you know, kind of some of the older companies that may kind of get a reality check when um, they're looking looking to uh, in, you know, raise capital and might experience a down round. So I think one thing we really want to make sure is that um, we continue to drive the right type of capital to this market and that companies have access to debt so they can actually fund debt-like activities with debt rather than equity. Um, when it comes to being burnt on uh, this question, I'd say, you know, most of our investments that didn't go so well were um, kind of the, the crazier, wonkier investments. We we invested in some micro hydro investments in the 2010s um, because, you know, there's a lot of promise that um, with mini grids and with micro grids in particular, you know, there's a chance to actually um, reach customers more deeply and they have access to more than maybe than just lighting. Um, the issue is that the capex is just so high, and Acumen's you know one million dollar checks from an equity perspective um, pale in comparison to what they really need, which is infrastructure financing. Um, so you know I think we're learning a lot. I think the mini grid sector is doing its best, um, but on the solar system side, you know it's been a ride, ups and downs, um, down rounds, up rounds. But overall, I'd say that uh, the business model has done you know done well on the solar system side. Um, from a returns perspective, I think we've all tempered our expectations and. And um, as long as we're sort of thoughtful and responsible about growth and make sure our expectations are, are in check, um, we've, uh, yeah, we, we're landing in a place that I think uh, the sector is um, kind, of, kind of where it needs to be. Perfect. Um, Edda and Jeffrey, your responses quickly before we wrap this up. I think just sorry, Jeffrey, sorry. go ahead. Okay. Um, I think just you know the from a portfolio perspective, it's really too early to say for us. Um, so you know we haven't had any um, problems yet per se, um, but uh, yeah, it's just it's just too early. There's a long way to go. Um, I think what we've learned is as a debt provider, you know I think we've gotten some things right. Um, our focus from the beginning has been on local currency. And I continue to believe that that's absolutely critical. Um, just echoing what Leslie said about the right type of capital, I think when we're putting leverage into these companies for receivables, it's really critical to do that as much as possible in local currency. Um, and so I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that part of our strategy. I think, you know, maybe some of the other things that we haven't gotten quite so right um, is just around embedding enough flexibility in the debt facilities because these are 
you know, still very much emerging companies, business models are evolving and changing. And I think, um, you know, if you, as, as a debt provider, you know, you like to have lots of structure around it, but at the same time, I think you need to embed enough flexibility um, or introduce enough flexibility so that the companies can be reasonably agile um, to address the different challenges that they're seeing. Thanks, Jeff. Edda, your thoughts? Yeah, so um, we've been in the sector for a while and thankfully I think we've made some really good bets um, actually. And uh, so we haven't really had any catastrophic um, type situations, but what I will say, and this is something that I think the entire sector has been a bit of a learning for the entire sector, is just really around product customer fit um, and whether it's, you know, how we see a migration from, We've seen a migration from Pico to larger systems because of this affordability and sustainability problem, essentially. That's really what's been a driver behind, uh, behind that shift. We've just seen that within the last, you know, within the last few years, this is, the issue has sort of bubbled to the top where, where co uh, companies have to make a decision around which customers can I actually serve right now, given, given my capital structure, given the ability of, the availability of capital, and given the customer's ability to pay, right? So I think there's been a bit of come to Jesus in that bit. Um, but to, I think, I think it was Leslie who made the comment around, you know, this still is a sector that needs to reach a broad base of people, right? And so I think the next, the next learning or the next phase of that is, is really coming to terms with the, the, the capital sources that will enable that to happen, right? So whether it's, you know, BBOX partnership in Togo and um, we've seen something in Rwanda where, you know, the government is essentially um, recognizing that off-grid is, 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 a, um, is, is, is potentially a really good tool to reaching broader electrification and they're putting some, they're putting some, 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 some of their, you know, money where their mouth is in that, in that, in that regard, we are going to see that if we want the sector to reach as many people as possible and to have broader customer product um, fit, that you know, this, this, we're going to have to think a little bit differently about how it's funded as well. So I think one of the early assumptions in the sector is that you could reach, you know, kind of the broad base of customers with Pico systems and that, that didn't pan out just because you just didn't have the ability to build um, the types of organizations that would enable you to do that in a sustainable way off of that sort of, um, off of that sort of revenue base, right? So I think that's, that's been a big learning for us. And then we've, you know, given the fact that many of the, the companies in our portfolio are pure distribution companies, they've been able to flex to that reality and then also position themselves that if they want to partner with a government through, you know, a small subsidy, that they're able to do that because they're already there, they're already recognized, and they can not just move up the um, move, move up the chain in in, in terms of uh, move up the income ladder in terms of serving customers, but they can still, because of how they're positioned already, be able to 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 to, to serve a broader base if the if the capital is there, if the support is there, so. That's been a big learning, and I think we'll see some evolution on that side. Okay, um, I realize we are way past time. We have questions that we've received. Unfortunately, we will not be able to get to all of them. I think some of them have been spoken about in, in this interaction. Unfortunately, um, some we will not be able to address. What we will do is um, the Google communications team is going to come up with a blog where we are going to address the questions that have not been answered. I want to take time to say thank you to all the attendees that made it to this webinar. I thank you to our panelists, Edda, Jeffrey, and Leslie. Thank you very, very much for your help, for your time, um, for answering our questions. If uh, any of the attendees has any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, for now, I want to end this. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.